You're listening to the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann, a listener-supported program. My guests for this episode are Eric and Victoria of Charm City Farms, a permaculture-based urban agriculture initiative that focuses on educating and supporting individuals and communities in and around Baltimore, Maryland. During the conversation today, we open by talking about the development of a quarter-acre public food forest in Clifton Park and the requirement for grant funding and organizing volunteers in order to be successful with the project, as well as the permaculture and primitive skills classes they offer. During the second half, we dig into one of those courses in detail, The Forager's Apprentice, which Victoria is running. That leads to a discussion about the role of blending academic rigor with hands-on experiences. Throughout this conversation, we move between the practical and the philosophical, and how both play an important role in practicing permaculture and creating deep experiences. Before we begin, listener support is vital to the continuation of this show. If everyone who listened pledged $1 a month at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast, then production of this show could become a full-time endeavor, allowing for more interview episodes to be released each week, plus additional material such as live reporting from events and more in-person interviews like this one with Eric and Victoria. If everyone signed up at $5 a month, event coverage and in-person conversations could include extensive video, live streaming, and more, as the Permaculture Podcast would become a team of folks working together full-time to create more of what it is you want to hear, see, and read. To put it simply, the show has grown beyond being a one-person, part-time operation. Also, Have you shared the podcast with anyone lately? If not, take two minutes and send the link to your favorite episode to a friend. Post it on Facebook or Twitter. Write a blog entry about what it is that you've learned. Create a YouTube video and let people know what you've learned over the years by being a listener to the show. Let people know about this valuable resource that you enjoy. Now then, on to Eric and Victoria. I'll join you again after the interview. And here I am with Eric and Victoria of Charm City Farms, sitting down to talk about their work within the city of Baltimore including their growing food forest in the Clifton Park and other projects throughout the area. If you could go ahead, as usual, with this show and give us a bit of your background and how you came to permaculture and what you're currently doing, we can take the conversation from there. Okie dokie. Let's see, my background, I'm going to start young. When I was a kid, I guess middle school, and before I was into bushcraft, primitive skills, outdoors, plants, all that, grew up had to get like a real job and so I was a glass mechanic I did residential commercial flat glass for years I had my own business and then I got into a car accident and gave up the glass business and the real world (laughs) as it seems I went on hiatus hiked part of the Appalachian Trail carried about six pounds worth of field guides with me had not heard of permaculture at that time that was 2011 came back off the trail took a master gardener's course, master naturalist course, seeking something, took a permaculture course and found what I was seeking and have been pretty gung-ho ever since. Quick and dirty bio. That works. The only piece I was wondering is when you took your PDC, who did you study with? Wayne Wiseman. I took my PDC with Wayne Wiseman and my teacher training with Wayne Wiseman. I guess I have a similar start where as a kid I was... A really crazy nature kid. I grew up in the Atlanta suburbs, like old suburbs, so lots of woods. I mean, uh, streams, you could kind of like run around all day long, nonstop. No one had any idea where I was, and that was totally okay. I also grew up with a, a cabin in the North Georgia mountains, you know, right at the base of the Smokies, and that was really, in a way, I don't think I'd be alive if it weren't for that growing up that I did there. Um, And then, you know, I got lost, I think, like a lot of people do, or, you know, went through a lot of struggles as I grew up and became a teenager and just felt so much conflict, you know, with how I felt and how, how it seemed like the world was. And it was really, I think it was my second year of college. I had been a visual artist my whole life, and that's really all that I understood. It's all that was really my whole identity at the time. That's really, really all I was doing was, you know, a lot of figure drawing, things like that. And I had a total breakdown. And I remember walking into a meeting with my studio art professor and I was like crying. I just couldn't, like, I couldn't produce anything. And she said, well, what do you, what do you really want to, what do you really want to draw? And I was like, you know, I think I just want to like draw the weeds in the sidewalk, all these plants that I like grew up with as a kid. But that's so stupid and shameful and like that's you know 
it's all about you know the human figure that's what's intense she was like no i think that that sounds really cool why don't you do that um so i did so i walked right back to my studio space and just you know took out ink and brush and started this like i don't know these crazy vines and they eventually like took over my whole studio space and i had this enormous painting drawing of just all these wreathing vines and forms like that and that was really kind of a, a pivotal point i guess where you know a lot of things started to collapse inside of me and who i was and uh, the plants were kind of a catalyst for that they brought me back to childhood so it meant that i had to spend the next many 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 years looking at like my childhood and that meant looking into depth psychology and all those things that i think a lot of young kids do nowadays you know reading through carl jung and joseph campbell and trying to understand um what was going on inside of me and how much i was not free and how much i needed to be free so i did you know a lot of different stuff in college because of that at the same time started studying herbal medicine in college because like a lot of young white girls i didn't feel well you know i think a lot of americans i didn't feel well and felt really terribly treated by a lot of doctors that i would go to so i think i started on that path of asking the question of what is what is medicine, I guess. And that was so much fun and it like broke me into this, you know, world from childhood again that I loved. I could be out in the woods with my teacher, professor, and learning about plants all the time and making potions again, basically. So I didn't want to be an herbalist, I didn't want to go to herb school. And I really stuck with a lot of the depth psychology stuff um, and healing arts and after I graduated from college I went into a lot of different healing arts schools and trainings they were pretty in-depth kind of hopped all over the country for a number of years just seeking out whatever teacher I respected the most and then eventually landed more into what are basically just like hardcore spiritual schools and I had a real allergy to that word at the time, you know, I was like, don't get that word anywhere near me. You know, I was much more into what's called inner work or fourth way, which is a very, in a way, step-by-step -step way of, you know, being with a, a community and a teacher that helps you take apart all of the things that you think you are. And, you know, I ended up finishing that phase of my life in a very intensive four-year period at a spiritual school here in Baltimore, which is how I eventually got here had a very intensive training along with it. But all the while, I was studying plants on my own, I guess, since since that foundation in botany and ethnobotany I'd gotten in college. And just tinkering, constantly tinkering on my own. I um, always had field guides, always had nature journals, was always, you know, my whole life, I've always had crazy gardens wherever I've lived, even like in the nooks and crannies of New York City when I was so miserable. And, um, I think uh, I was in New York City for a while and uh, learning a lot of things and then had another big collapse and ended back at my cabin in Georgia for a year living with my dad to really just rethink everything. And I think that's the year where permaculture really, I became aware, I think, of what that word meant. Um, and I got some books and I read Guy's Garden by Toby Hemingway and I just had the freedom to like tinker with the land for like a whole year and just like you know I was crazy like I started out just like thinking everything had to be in a raised bed and we had to buy all this dirt and like even this nature kid that I was like I just tried all this crazy stuff and uh, planting fruit trees in really poor ways and starting all this stuff from seed and you know god you know the amount of times I tried to find you know passion flower nearby so that I could try to germinate those seeds, you know, just is, you know, total dork area at the time, also getting into wild plants and how to cook them and how to preserve them and just, you know, being a witch in the kitchen all the time. And so I think f ever since then, which was only a few years ago now, maybe three years ago, I've really been focusing on plants with less shame and, uh, so I was, you know, I was uh, traveling back and forth to Baltimore for many years, um, either from New York City or from Georgia to do that schooling here I mentioned. Um, and then last year I met Eric and what he was doing with Charm City Farms and felt like I instantly finally connected to what somebody else, somebody else was doing in this, especially because it was like somebody else who likes to just run and play in the woods and like 
you know, oh, he liked to pretend he was Indian as a kid, too. And like, I can talk about how much I just love bamboo and, you know, stuff like that. So really just be a little kid and dork and just do really what I love to do. So it's kind of been a little bit of a whirlwind since then. Um, we got involved in a lot of projects and tried a lot of stuff. And I've thrown myself into a lot of teaching in all different ways, some of which has been awesome and some of which has like been totally tanked. Um, so I've learned a heck of a lot that way. And here I am now, kind of been living in Baltimore full time for a year and kind of have my roots down a little bit in whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing here. So. I guess that's a little bit of a long, long story. I'm always interested in how people come to this kind of work, or wherever the path may have taken them, as well as wherever the story goes to get us there, so that we might understand each other a little bit better. So thank you both for that. And though I guess, Victoria, have you studied permaculture formally, taken the PDC and gone that like certification route, or not? So no, and I'm really happy to say that in a way, because... I really feel very well seated in, I don't know, I even hate to use that term permaculture movement, but whatever the heck this is, and I didn't take the route of training with any kind of permaculture curriculum, and maybe I will down the road, I have to be totally honest that the way that I have come to understand what I'm doing came through training in inner work, what, I, what I'm referring to as inner work, and a lot of that rigorous spiritual training. And I know permaculture is really allergic to those words sometimes. And, and then, you know, just my basic background in ethnobotany, herbalism. So really, I'm just being who I am. And if the word permaculture works for what I'm doing, it works. And right now it does. So yeah, I, I, I hope that answers your question. It does. And I feel that the conversation about the spiritual side of life and that inner work, as much as sometimes it's engaged in as an understanding of like personal psychology and other times as a spiritual path or religious tradition, is something that permaculture as a community needs to address at some point and is a conversation that I'd like to have on the show sometime. And just as with that, the education that's being packaged around permaculture that there are many different ways to get here it's just that the pdc has been for so long that place where many of us arrived here but isn't necessarily the way that we have to go with everything you've shared so far and with that said it sounds like from the conversations that i had with both of you when we were getting prepared for this interview and as you mentioned some victoria that the two of you are kind of establishing a sense of place here in baltimore in the city in the surrounding county with some of the work that you're doing And I was wondering if you could share some of that with us, that work, as well as the projects that you're currently engaged in. When I got back to Baltimore off of the AT and lived in my mom's basement, I started the Foragers of Baltimore first. And that was, I think, to try to add a lens to people's vision when they're looking at a landscape. And then I came to permaculture and really started to see the hemorrhaging of resources in the city. And so I moved actually into the city from just outside in the in the county. And I started to learn very quickly of other groups and, uh, and a lot of resources and the support that the city and the mayor uh, has for urban agriculture and projects like I wanted to do, that I dreamed of, that I thought I didn't think it would be supported at all. And then through working with Baltimore Orchard Project and being a busybody, (laughs) I uh, was offered this one space where the Clifton Park Food Forest now is. It's a quarter acre inside Clifton Park. And through the support of Baltimore Orchard Project and Civic Works, uh, we were able to come up with the finances and the labor to install what is now the infant stages of the food forest, I guess. And we have a lot of volunteer support pretty frequently in in the food forest. I think one of the things we struggle with is having um, skilled labor in the food forest. There's a lot of enthusiasm, but 
maybe not necessarily the 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 technique there that you know even to pull weeds because we can't just say leave this tree and pull the weeds because some of the weeds we love and we want them to stay there too and it's i guess hard to determine what they are unless you know what they're doing there which is why we teach classes (laughs) on this stuff and so recently this other lot we actually won't sign the lease until the fall. The city has agreed to take care of certain things like soil testing, removing a concrete slab, and repairing the roof uh, in what we are going to call the brick barn on the lot. And um, what I hope to do there, that's in the Johnston Square area. Uh, what I hope to do there is a food forest that blends into a holistic orchard that blends into a intensive small-scale agriculture where we can crank out a lot of annual vegetables that people can identify with in hopes to economically maintain the area. The brick barn is a 30 by 50 brick garage that is partitioned into two sections that I hope to put a kitchen and classroom in in one half and then the bottom half to be a uh, workshop so that I can teach kids and adults I guess uh, shop class stuff like fundamentals and carpentry and uh, basic auto mechanics and things like that. One of the things that impressed me when I went to visit your food forest is that even though it was only planted a year ago you already have a lot already going on there a lot more than many nascent projects that I've encountered that are even two, three, or even five years old. I was wondering, when it comes to like the finances and labor and some of the stuff that you've put in place to get that going, what was that process like to raise the money to do it and to engage to find the right volunteer groups? I think I'll start with the organizational part. As I spoke about in the food forest, uh, I know a lot of permies we talk about, well, some... Some permits talk about the undesirable parts of hierarchy, but I think having something like that here worked out very well, where really I was in charge of the whole thing, and I just put all the pieces together, and I didn't have, we didn't have administrative lockup, we didn't have uh, common problems like that, it was just here's this, here's this, run with it, and, and I did. And so the Civic Works was offer was able to get us a grant. So we started, well, the whole thing was $5,000. Um, and that grant came from fines that large contractors have to pay when they cut down large trees in the city. So those fines were recycled back into a positive thing, like it's supposed to be used for planting trees. So... The food forest was born. Now, the the grant, the $5,000, was supposed to be just for trees. But we, through conversation, we're like, well, trees don't just do trees. Like, we need support species. We need fungal matter. We need, you know, other materials other than trees for trees to be a success. I mean, we plant trees in tree pits all, all over the city, and they, you know, they grow up 40 feet tall and die and fall in people's houses and stuff. So, um we needed more than that. So it was loosely agreed that it didn't have to be all trees. It was actually only about 30% trees and a lot of support species underneath. So the volunteers, a lot of them started with, I think they were already involved with the Baltimore Orchard Project. So they were already kind of had the language and the experience with trees. Uh, I also have a meetup group uh, the Charm City Farms Meetup Group. Well, I have three, but Charm City Farms Meetup Group, and I just put a blast out, all hands on deck, and we got like 30 volunteers that came out and helped us plant all the trees. And since then, we have volunteers when needed for bigger projects. Right now, I wanted to build kind of a consistent team, so we do two select Fridays a month, and I've invited master gardeners and tree keepers and other people like that out to the food forest to come and help as well as we have the online journal every other week journal of the goings on in the food forest which i think is cool how important has that volunteer base been to being able to start and maintain this project in its first year well i guess i should mention too how can i word this the volunteers that come out i love that they come out and they help Um, i love that they have experience I don't love that they're not actually from that community. 
the free forest is intended to be for the community. Now, I guess it doesn't have to be for that community. Anybody can come in and help themselves to whatever is there. But I would really like to see the neighbors of the Clifton Park area come out and help. So with that, we I guess we need other volunteers to do outreach and marketing for that. But to get it installed and everything without actual um, financial backing for me to do it and to pay for labor, it, it wouldn't have been done. So they were very crucial to have volunteers out there. And you saw the big masses of uh, of weeds, actual weeds that we don't want there this time right now, <laughs> that they pulled up that we're going to turn, you know, we're going to hot compost and turn into good soil that we can use in there and maybe even at some point offer it to other gardeners. But so, I mean, the volunteer, the community is very important, I think, for all these projects. And like I said, we're hemorrhaging resources in the city and humans are one of them. I mean, there's plenty of people in the city without jobs that need stuff to do. And I think if we could get them on this good path and direction, it could offer even paying jobs in the future, maybe. That for something like this to work as a model in other communities, it may be worth working with Job Corps and other type programs where individuals can come in and gain training in a food forest setting, perhaps be paid with some of the plant cuttings or food that comes from that, and then provide them an opportunity to build up their skills with, so that they could be useful in other related career fields, so that they could be learning about trimming trees or planting trees to be then working with a landscaping company or something like that. I think offering a specialized skill is is huge. I don't think that they would be satisfied working with a landscape company because landscape companies typically are hiring unskilled labor. And by the time somebody comes out of a food forest for after a couple of years, they're going to have so much more knowledge than, you know, sitting at the table with landscapers. I hate to say that, I guess, but it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> But I think having that specialized skill could, you know, they could move on and develop their own projects. And that's what I hope that they do. And like I said on the lot, I don't want any, either of these to be my long, long-term long project either. I want to get them rolling, give them back to the community and bounce off to something else. Though you're rooted here for the time being, both of these projects serve as incubators, not only for yourself, but also for the community to see these kinds of projects and then take ownership of them once they're established so that they can be replicated in other areas of the city? Yes, absolutely. I hope that, um, and that's why I kind of became a busybody was, was I saw and knew that there was immensely better ways to manage landscapes, especially all the lots and blighted areas that aren't being used. But there's also places in Baltimore that are like small pocket parks and small wood lots that, an immense amount of labor and resources goes into, but it doesn't actually produce anything that we can use. Now, I mean, it's good eco services, I guess, but it's, like I said, it's just a resource suck because, like, there's labor, there's plenty of volunteers there doing stuff. They just pull weeds, and they don't put, like, persimmons or pecans or anything in there, so they're going to be fighting weeds for the rest of their life. This takes the holistic land management practices of permaculture and at least puts it on the radar of city and county land managers? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I did a, so I, I offered a public tour. I didn't publicize it as much as I probably should have. As I said, the, it's kind of it's in its infant stages, the food forest. But I do have Baltimore Green Space coming there this month. Uh, they're bringing their tree keeper or their or tree keepers or some people <laughs> to take a look at it. And so, yeah, I hope that it does kind of change some perspective on what is possible. With the projects you're working on in the outreach, you're also offering a lot of classes and courses that integrate some of these ideas for community members. Could you share with us some of the offerings that you've had and what the response has been like to that and how that's adjusting what you're doing moving forward? It's actually kind of a it's an interesting way that you phrase that because it's something that we struggle with. We feel that all the classes we offer are an integration of life skills, but we've had to compartmentalize and separate them all because the same people that want to learn about camp canning goods do not want to learn about foraging. The same people that want to learn about rabbit processing do not necessarily want to learn about how to make cordage. So it's kind of weird. 
so on our website, it's hard for us to categorize where to put things like, say, rabbit processing. For me, it could be bushcraft primitive skills at the same time could be farming, I guess. So we offer foraging walks. We offer cooking demonstrations of wild foods. We do primitive skills, bushcraft skills, cordage making, animal hide processing. Victoria is leading the forager's apprentice this year. So you'll have to get on the waiting list for next year. What else? Canning, soap making. I should have got a list. It's interesting that you mention these skills as life skills. Last year at Mother Earth News, uh, the fair in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, my photographer did a video with the head of the North American Bushcraft School down in West Virginia. And he referred to these skills as many of the bushcraft or survival skills as life skills and permaculture skills because they're so applicable and it was only as I began to walk down that road again after having kind of stepped away from it for 15 years and looking at bushcrafting and cord making and all of that and just looking at how using like lacing for pottery repair then I had a bin that was broken that I grabbed some cord and was then able to lace together and repair it which then meant that I didn't need to replace that bin which really fit in very well with the permaculture ethics and a lot of the principles that come from it because I was a more skilled individual and was in a space to apply my knowledge to limit my need to extract or use other resources by knowing these very basic on the ground skills that just seem to be lost in education now. You know, we're not taught a lot of these basic things because at least from my background and experience, it was, well, you'll go to school, you'll get educated, you'll work a job that'll, you'll then have enough money that if you need to have somebody replace drywall, you'll call somebody who does that. If you want somebody to paint, you'll call them. And it really disconnected myself from all this knowledge that has been accumulated within our culture for so long but that somewhere just within a couple of generations, it seems that we've been pushed away from that. And I'm really glad for all the folks who are teaching these kinds of, I don't want to say basic skills, but for lack of a better word in the moment, but people who are teaching these kinds of skills that return us back to the things that are needed within community. Because as we talk about like the broader invisible structures in permaculture, well, if we're going to live in community with each other, we all kind of need to have a more than one specialty and have a variety of skills that we can all bring to bear together in order to make a difference to the space that we live in. Though I've gone a little off field there. I appreciate what you and others are bringing back to permaculture from that background. With all that said, Victoria, could you tell us a bit about that Forger's Apprentice and the role that you see that filling for your students? Sure. So... When I first got involved with Charm City Farms, like I first, you know, I found Eric through uh, searching for plant walks in the city. I guess last May when I decided I was going to live here full time and I was still steeped in the schooling I was doing and realized I had to do, I had to do something that I liked. So I was going to, you know, start doing some plant walks around Baltimore and wanted to see who else was doing that. And, you know, quick Google search led me to Foragers of Baltimore, which is a group Eric started. So I got in touch with him and said, you know, what are you doing? Can I help out? He probably thought I was a yuppie duppy goofball, um, but agreed to meet me anyway. And we romped around in the woods and really connected in, in how we were thinking about plants and other things. So I really jumped on board to the plant-based programming that Charm City Farms was doing um, very quickly. Um, I started teaching a lot of what what people refer to as foraging type of education, which is a lot of a lot of plant walks. Um, so a lot of going around and you know looking in very minute detail with a lot of attention at you know all these little tiny leaves that are in, in the sidewalk and on the side of the road and teasing apart what are you know what is this what is this what does this smell like what does this feel like um, what's this plant called how you know getting into the botany and the taxonomy of it and um, how, you know, teaching people how we can use these plants whose uses have become very uncommon nowadays. So that that also meant uh, teaching workshops on, you know, having people cook, cook a lot of this stuff start to finish and kind of, you know, get comfortable 
you know, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, to introduce a person to some wild plants if it's like, you know, milkweed flowers that are frittered with powdered sugar on top or, you know, some kind of interesting, you know, berry wine or something. These are all just kind of teasers to get people sassafras tea, you know, just things like that. Um, all these little methods that we use to see how right uh, Eric's sassafras ice cream to kind of tease people into like, please be interested in plants, please, please. In order to teach what I really love, uh, which is that course that Eric referred to, um, it's the first time I'm offering it here or ever, which I'm calling the Forager's Apprentice course. And all it is, it's um, it's called Foundations in Botany, Wild Food, and Herbal Medicine. Um, and I see it as a very rudimentary, you know, boots to the ground type of 35 hour course over spread out over I think about three months just meets about every other Saturday um, and that starts this September and that's for really any any type of person who really wants to learn about plants just really focus on plants um, so a lot of people some people are coming um, pre or post permaculture design course once they realize I think that like the permaculture design course is about a lot of things and not just plants um, but plants are also important um, a lot of people come from being interested in herbal medicine and wanting to get a little more into that a lot of people come f seem like they're coming from training in herbal medicine already but that's kind of the clinical side um, and online and don't really have the direct you know person to plant interaction going on and really everything in between so I'm, re I'm really excited about that. It's going to be just, you know, foundation, just some really basic hands-on foundations and understanding how to use botany and taxonomy and why that's important and why it's important to, you know, get to know the Latin name of every plant out there and um, really the, the nitty gritty of like all the constituents that are in these plants and how those apply to their food capacities and how they apply to their medicinal capacities, how they're functioning in the ecosystem that we are, whether it's like deep in the city or kind of in these park areas in the county, like what is going on? And like all this stuff is growing and what's really going on. And I hope it's something that will kind of help to give people um, a little bit of traction in whatever bit of passion they're feeling about plants um, and to help them really figure out how to apply that into whatever direction that they're feeling called. And then I'm bringing in guest teachers too, which I'm really excited about for, you know, my weakest points, which I'm like, oh man, I would love to do so many more guest teachers, but I'm having a mycology se a section done by the, um, we're calling him our local mushroom, passionate mushroom expert. His name is Michael Weiss and another local or local clinical herbalist named Olivia Fight. She's doing the clinical herbalism side. So I'm really excited about it. It's all outdoors. It's going to be book heavy and, and notes heavy, but also just really you got to take your shoes off and roll around in the mud. Coming from the classes and work that you've done thus far, you find that that combination of book and hands-on is a good way to approach it? I think so. I think I am a person that is really a product of academics and higher academics and I love academics in a way and I really appreciate really rigorous academics um, all my life I've been through like really rigorous you know private college prep high school and you know whatever college I picked even if they were really bizarre and I just really I think like the greatest teachers in my life have been the greatest gifts to me and I feel like I've my life has been colored um, and the direction of my life has been given by those great teachers that I've had in many, many fields. Um, and the teachers I respect the most are the ones that are really just like blazing a trail that is unique and just makes a heck of a lot of sense in a magnificent way, but it's probably out of the ordinary. But teachers who are really challenging, who really um, kind of hold the bar like a little bit above your head always and really make you build some muscle. So again, this is a, a very introductory course and it's, you know, it's not going to be that intense, but I do believe in uh, reading, like really, um, and reading things that people think are too tough for them to read, even if it's just a little bit. I'm um, getting into breaking that barrier when it comes to the vocabulary of different systems. I'm um, just breaking into the vocabulary of herbal medicine, Western herbal medicine, and 
binomial nomenclature, you know, all these things that are intimidating to people, but that really aren't, that are just really useful tools. And I, I think it's, it's important in a world where plants don't really have the status that animals and other human beings do, that it, it does kind of mean something. Um, if you're, you know, if you're just a hippie walking around being like, oh yeah, this is yellow dock and you can use it for this. And it's really great plant. We should all love yellow dock. No one's going to listen to you. And it's not much is going to come of it. But, you know, if you can say, you know, this plant is Rumex crispus and here's the, the family and the genus and it's, you know, it contains these chemical constituents in it. And there's some studies that have been done on this, this and that. And here's how I use it. And I've been eating it for years. And here's what it's doing in my garden. And here's how it's helping me. Um, it's both practical and it's also shows that you that you at least are giving a darn good try to understand what's going on and that you've, you've cracked some books. And I think that that really has value in our world. I have a great deal of appreciation for that academic rigor that you're coming from. And it's something that in many ways I feel is a necessary critique of a lot of what's occurring with permaculture. And there was an issue of Permaculture Activist, now Permaculture Design Magazine, two or three issues back that was discussing, you know, the scientific side of permaculture and doing that kind of research. And for some time, and I mean, it exists in the literature, it's within the designer's manual and elsewhere, that there was a certain needing to get this information to the hands of so many people that it had a non-academic direction and was almost antithetical to go in that, into that space and to partner with like the land grant universities and others to do this research. But now as agroforestry and some of these other ideas become more prominent, that it's another space for permaculture practitioners to step into. And as we spent some time talking about the different ways that it seems now that permaculture practitioners are cobbling together a living, that there are plenty of places that if you're already a botanist doing botany, then apply permaculture to that space. Do that research that would benefit everybody from within our community and without. And there are more and more intersections where we as practitioners either coming to permaculture or wanting to step out of it, can really engage ourselves and do more. And that it doesn't necessarily need to be in an academic background and go and get a master's in botany or a PhD in this, that, or the other. What if it's a space that someone wants to play in, then why not? But that that level of passion and devotion to the art and the craft of this work should be universal from any of us regardless of what place we come from in doing it. Yeah, I think one thing I'll add to that is just that I I think it's very funny that when I finally stepped out of, you know, whatever, 16 years of, you know, schooling since childhood and stepped out of college and whatnot, really had no skills. I had absolutely no skills. And I, I was a great student and I gave everything to my studies. I had no skills. And really just from all the tinkering in my life that I've done since being a kid until now, just tinkering with plants and just endlessly flipping through books and endlessly trying things that I've, I've found myself in a very, all of a sudden I look up and I'm in a very um, strange little niche here all of a sudden. And people are asking me questions about every plant and all of a sudden, in this very practical, matter-of-fact kind of way, that like, this leaf is different from this leaf. That's probably the most practical value that I have on this planet right now. And I think that's, that's funny, and it's also heartbreaking, you know? And I think this kind of stuff, which I have struggled so hard to gather this knowledge and keep gathering it, and, you know, I only... You know, people, I think, look at me sometimes after plant walks, like, oh, my God, she's like an encyclopedia. And I think that, like, I know, like, this is a little speck, like a little speck of, you know, of sand on the tip of an iceberg of, like, what there is to know. Like, I know nothing, essentially know nothing. And at the same time, I think this is stuff that every human should know because I think it makes you dynamic and it makes you flexible in how you inhabit the place that you do and not so afraid because you're what you see as resources or what you can eat or what you can use or are everywhere and they're malleable and they change and you know if you really know plants you're never alone you got friends everywhere what's funny with that is so i barely barely graduated high school but when i was a kid i always saw a lot of value with skills 
So to this day, I don't think I've ever spent more than $2,000 on a vehicle because I've always been confident I could tear the whole thing apart and fix whatever was wrong. And to date, I haven't been wrong. <laughs> and so, I mean, I fixed Victoria's vehicles. And I'm not a mechanic by any means. <laughs> but um, I can build them as anything with my hands. I can make knives. I can till the ground and all kinds of stuff. So the world of academia at the time when I was a kid had nothing to offer me. You know, I didn't think. When I was a kid, I would write. A, I remember writing a letter to my grandfather for him to save all broken electric electric and gas appliances so I could tear them apart and learn how to work them and fix them and stuff. So I've always I've always liked that. Hated school. But now my two addictions two addictions now are books and seeds. With that idea of skills, I came to permaculture originally from a disaster preparedness background, what some would call like survivalism. But I had I grew up in Boy Scout troops and things that, you know, it was a challenge for us to how little could we take into the woods with us. You know, if I gave you a knife right now, what could you do with it if that was your only tool? Okay, what if I took away your knife? What tools could you create with your bare hands? And then sometime when I was a teenager, a lot of that went away. But then as an adult, going to that disaster preparedness, survivalism kind of mindset, man, there are a lot of gearheads. There are a lot of folks who just want to like buy a backpack and go into the woods and figure they're going to make it. And it was the more that I walked down that path and the more that permaculture came into my life and more and more on my radar that I began to realize that the more skills I have, the less tools and equipment and technology that I need. And then it was when I realized that, you know, no person is truly an island, that the community and network around us of people becomes even more important and how then we can learn skills from others and share skills. And it doesn't matter what someone's background is. It's what each of us brings to the table, which was a strange learning lesson for me because of how it removed a lot of the elitism that came with certain academic circles, certain social circles and things, because there was a greater appreciation for the people who were around us. And there was something you said earlier, Victoria, in conversation before we started recording about I don't remember the exact words, that it wasn't just about taking care of someone or something. Uh, so I think what you were talking about is we were talking about the word right, and a lot of people want to know how to do something right, or what's the right way to garden, or what's the right way to live on the earth. And uh, I said that I, I really feel that word right is a, has been abbreviated in our in our world right now. And I usually feel that the whole question is to do right by someone or to do right by this plant and when we when we use those words I think it usually becomes very clear to us because it becomes not about ethics at all and um, if we say you know how do I do right by my neighbor here it becomes very clear to us or how do I do right by this tree or this plant that I may have all these ideas about or someone else may have all these ideas about to do right by that other automatic auto, automatically makes that other like our brother you know a, a, a part of us and so I, I guess that answers your hope that answers your question it very much does thank you I feel that that question helps us to enter into a right relationship with every person every plant every animal every form of life around us in a functional way that's more approachable than trying to talk generically about caring for the earth or caring about people or fair shares. I think it's a piece of what Mollison gets into, if I'm remembering correctly, in the beginning of the designer's manual about reframing our questions and asking different questions that it's not about what can I get from something, but what is there to be given? Or like when we think about yields, thinking about secondary and tertiary, that it's not just necessarily about human needs directly, but the way that that cascades throughout the ecosystem and has even greater benefits than if we just think about, well, I can get a cherry or an apple. Eric, you have a follow-up? Let me see if I can remember this right. Remember, I'm not academic. Usually farmers, we look look at something, how many yields can I get out of this? And Mollison says, well, how many yields can I get out of this if we cooperate with it? Yeah, I'll also add to that that I think that a lot of these ways of thinking and doing and deconstructing that fall under the umbrella of permaculture are a heck of a lot about intimacy. Um, and I think that that, 
that word sums up a lot intimacy of relationship which with each individual thing in a whole system and then you know the kind of the whole system that is this mis- very very mysterious arising of of all of those individual things um, and I think that man just like real relationship with anything is so absent in at least the culture that I grew up in and I think that I never experienced it I think I maybe experienced it as a kid and never experienced it again until I started to you know walk into these places that were unfamiliar to me like I was always a plant dork really wasn't until I met Eric that I really had my eyes open to a lot of primitive skills stuff you know that it wasn't all about preppers and stuff like that and I really connected to it but boy did it open my eyes to animals and tracking and all this stuff and I had a lot of judgments about all that when I was younger and a lot of judgments about you know I was into like veganic farming there's a, such a thing as that um, where you just use like soy beans to fertilize another you know another garden it's complete insanity it was hard for me to like recognize how important animals are. And so I say that because, you know, the first time I really got really up close with a dead animal skinning it, it's probably one of the greatest lessons of my life and most transformative. And I don't think that I could have the relationship with plants now if I hadn't broken into that relationship with animals because you can't, like when you're covered in blood, you know, and you're inside an animal's skin and it's horrifying and it's disgusting and it smells terrible. And you, you know, you know, this was like, you know, this was an individual and you're pulling and ripping and like using your body. Like it's intense. And especially as like a first timer, like it's something really intense. And afterwards, it's a heck, it's a heck of a lot of work for a beginner, at least to, you know, tan a hide by hand and things like that it's it's stamina wise it's a lot of work it's a lot of figuring out and stuff like that but god damn it if i don't have a relationship with you know that that fox or foxes in general now because i had to get so intimate with it there were two moments for me when it came to that kind of work that gave me a better understanding of where food comes from and what's required in order for humanity to eat that really changed my perspective. But I think about the first time that I harvested an animal when hunting and what an experience that was because that was the first time that I took a life in a way that was truly and intentionally meant that way, that I had gone out of my way to do so and going and getting the license myself and everything that went into it and then taking life in that way for the first time in a very intentional and purposeful way it was a hard experience like to fire that shot and then to watch the animal die and know that i was responsible for that and being a part of it but even before then it was a time i wanted to learn how to take apart a chicken and started with just a you know from the refrigerator case chicken my chef's knife and a pair of shears and a copy of the joy of cooking And just sitting there in the first time when you go and use a a pair of shears and you have to, you know, you're cutting through ribs, you have to break a backbone. It's a very visceral experience that changes the way that for me, and it sounds like for you, is going through that process with an animal. It really changes your relationship and it takes it away from that, you know, styrofoam packaged, plastic wrapped anonymous meat that's just, you know, meat on a tray as opposed to life that is both food and sustenance, but also another living creature. Yeah, there's no way that you can pretend that you don't exist here when you're, you know, up inside an animal like that. There's no way that you can pretend that, you know, you can uh, opt out of all of these cycles of consumption. And I think in a way that's what a lot of people might, might be seeking. Because once you have the visceral experience that, you know, and that, you know, that fox story, that wasn't even, you know, a fox that I killed. It was already dead. But the gravity of participating with that thing is the same as like when I'm picking, you know, a leaf of, 
you know, lamb's quarters or whatever out of the garden. It's actually this, um, the gravity of it. But we usually, I think that that's, you know, we just think, oh, I'm just picking a leaf. And you are. You're like just picking a leaf. But the, the kind of exchange that's going on is something that I, I just think is lost in our vocabulary and lost in the vocabulary of experience, you know, at least for me, you know, in our culture today. And once you have that kind of relationship with this animal and that plant and, you know, this bug, you cannot but promise in some deep place to do right by that thing. Because materially, that thing, I know that thing as myself. And whoa, that sounds like some wooey-wooey spiritual nonsense. Because it is, if it's just an idea. But when it's like flesh and like your whole body shaking, then it's not an idea anymore. And it's not ethics and it's not spirituality. It's, you know, it's your heart beating and, and your breath fluttering in your body. We've covered a lot of territory in the last bit of time together so far today. And I really appreciate everything that you've both shared with me as part of the interview and in our time together today. Uh, walking me through the food forest and hearing about your your plans for the future and knowing what it is that you've already done and the connections that you've made. Because many of the pieces of this conversation and about the work of permaculture, there are often gaps that come out of a, of a permaculture design course or being new to this material that until you really dig into it and find a place to work from, you don't even know that you're missing the questions to ask, let alone that you need the answers to find for them, and how that can impact many of the projects that we work on, the people who we seek out as volunteers or partners or allies with the work that we do. And I really have enjoyed the conversation today and everything that you've brought to my understanding of permaculture and what we can do as practitioners to make a difference as well as the different places that everyone who might be interested in any kind of regenerative practice, whether it's permaculture or not, whether they're farmer, doctor, lawyer, teacher, someone, you know, a parent at home, or somebody who's left that world entirely, whatever their path might be, that we all have personal work too to get right with ourselves in order to get right with others and do this in a really deep, meaningful, and moving way. And with my reflection on all the places we've gone so far today, is there anything else that you would like individually or together to add to this conversation for the listeners before we draw this to a close? Yeah, I'd just like to add one more thing. It's just that I'm, I'm really appreciative that you said that because really the bottom line to me is that I think that for each one of us, our only responsibility, true responsibility is to give our lives to whatever it is that we are, to what some people might call, you know, following, listening to that still small voice inside, whatever, what Joseph Campbell would call following your bliss. And God, if we can all free ourselves up enough to have the courage to just do that and go for like where our passion is going, even if it doesn't make any sense, um, then this thing that's trying to happen, whatever's truly trying to happen, that's not an agenda called permaculture movement and that inevitably has to be so much bigger and so much more beautiful and so much more mysterious will happen like the highest of what can happen will happen and it'll totally transform me in the process and totally transform you in the process so yeah i just you know we should never keep ourselves in small boxes and you got to be willing to let go into free fall i think every once in a while and Eric waves away the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you both so much for all the time today. And that was Eric and Victoria of Charm City Farms. You can find out more about what they are doing, including the Food Forest Journal, at charmcityfarms.org, or via the link in the show notes at thepermaculturepodcast.com, which includes a resources section with additional links to the people and organizations mentioned in this episode. If you are in the area... I recommend getting in touch with Eric and Victoria and going to visit the food forest when they are having one of the regular Friday field days. If you can take a class with them, including the Forager's Apprentice when it opens next year, I highly recommend it. You'll find a complete listing 
of the different kinds of classes they offer in the show notes. Also sign up for their newsletter so you can get updates and see what classes are being offered when. Coming out of this interview, I've known Eric for some time through email exchanges and following his work through the Charm City Farms website. Knowing that he had a viable project going was why I wanted to sit down and speak to him and Victoria in person, as well as to go to the site and tour it. After going down and spending a day with Victoria and Eric, I was left with a positive impression of both of them, as well as what it is they are doing and the authenticity of their work. The food forest is in really good shape and incredibly integrated for being less than a year old. And as we walked through, they were both naming the various plants using the common names, as well as the Latin binomial. They also pointed out not only the successes so far, but also the failures. They raised questions about why one plant did well as an outlier, but then did not thrive in what should be, by all accounts, the ideal space for that same species and cultivar. When questioned about community engagement, their responses came with a humility and understanding of the difficulties of coming in as an apparent outsider and the need to integrate into a place to find out who the real leaders in a given neighborhood are in order to get the right buy-in and cooperation. I asked about population and demographics, and Eric was able to respond immediately and in great detail. We talked about the organizations and people and various initiatives in the city that went well beyond what you heard in the interview. They really are well connected with the ideas and people who can help make this work possible. Even as we were casually walking around and discussing the two sites they're developing, the information that Victoria and Eric were able to share bordered on encyclopedic. They've done the groundwork and really integrated themselves into what they are doing and taken on the roles they've decided for themselves and continue to look for ways to make the changes necessary to be more effective, including considering buying and renovating a home in the community near the second site they're looking to develop, where the red brick barn is located so they can be close to the space and also members of that community. We all find inspiration in different places for this permaculture work that we do. I know Ethan Hughes is an inspiration for many as he and his community are able to live within the gift economy without gas or electricity on a beautiful site in Missouri. But in conversations I've had with Ethan off the air, he knows, however, that the Possibility Alliance model isn't something that most can do. It really is for a very small group of people who are able to make that kind of transition. So what about everybody else? And I think that what Eric and Victoria are doing in the city, in place, is a path many, many more can follow. I'm reminded of Bob Tyson, his comment, which I'll paraphrase, that there are plenty of good places we can repair and restore that already exist, rather than inflicting ourselves on some place that doesn't really need us. And I go back to that idea of establishing a sense of place, even though what Eric is doing now is kind of an incubator for projects that can then be given back to the community, with his interest being in starting a farm outside of the city at some point. But still, there's a lot of value in being in a place and keeping your connections where you are to have those roots that will make a difference. And I go down this road stemming from the conversation with Ben Weiss and then an email I got recently from a listener and about that idea of, you know, so many people we know have moved somewhere else where there's already community or projects going on rather than staying and building something themselves. The listener email had this idea of the blap, that people are moving to Brooklyn, Boulder, Los Angeles, Asheville, or Portland to find what it is they're looking for when I think in many cases everything we need is where we already are. And by staying there and working within what we already know, I feel gives us all a better chance to succeed. Now that worldwide the majority of people live in cities and metropolitan areas, urban permaculture practitioners are more vital than ever. We can't keep moving to find something perfect. The world is finite as systems thinkers we know that deep down, but sometimes it's easy to look at a place and see that there just seems to be so much and that we can go there and these other things will be taken care of and not matter. But I see that as being, well, frankly, irresponsible. Not when we're already somewhere, someplace, in space and time, where we have all the tools to make a difference in a way that's meaningful and matters to a lot more people than just going and integrating ourselves into a large pre-existing community that's already saturated. Do the good work where you are, where you live. Practice permaculture every day. Create the world that you want to live in wherever you find yourself. And if you're in a place that needs you and we can work together to build the community or the resources that you need to make all this happen, get in touch. 
Call me, 717-827-6266. Email show at thepermaculturepodcast.com. Send me a letter, The Permaculture Podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dolphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. From here up next week is Adam Brock to discuss the role of a guest editor with Permaculture Design Magazine. Until then, make a difference with yourself, with others, with the earth. Do the best you can every day to make the world more bountiful for all life.